are you familiar much with JavaScript? Not as much as I should be. Tell me more. Well, <laughs> not, I, <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. Engineers have watched over 2 million hours of Frontend Masters videos to upgrade their skills in the latest best practices in frontend development and Node.js. Popular video courses of theirs include courses on Advanced JavaScript, Angular 2, React, API Design with Node, and Functional and Asynchronous JavaScript. Many of their teachers have even been guests on JavaScript Jabber. Check them out at frontendmasters.com. Hey everybody, and welcome to JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel we have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live uh, from uh, the, the Microsoft office at Times Square-ish area, right? That's that's where I am taking back the internet today. That's right. Uh, I'm Charles Maxwood from DevChat.tv. Yeah, we're at uh, the Microsoft Office 11 Times Square, which is kind of fun because I don't think AJ or I had ever been to New York City before. And we're here with Maria. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Yeah, I'm Maria Nagaga. I'm a program manager on the Visual Studio and .NET team, and New York is my area. I'm based in New York, so welcome to my town. Oh, cool. Thanks. Greatest city in the so <laughs> Barat, Barat said something, um, just just briefly explained that you do some kind of evangelism and work with new programmers. Do you want to kind of explain what you do here at Microsoft? Yeah, it's, like, it's really interesting. So when I first joined Microsoft four years ago, um, I was the only evangelist in New York at, right out of college. So wow, that was, that was a huge thing because I was in a brand new country, right. in a new state, and like telling people about all the awesome things that Microsoft were doing. So when I was recruited into this team, one of the challenges I presented to Scott Hanselman and Scott Hunter was how come we don't have enough net new developers, like pe net new developers in .NET? So I just took it upon myself to actually go into that field, go and reach out to places and say, let's teach the .NET stack. What does it look like? And can we have a boot camp or a course or an online course that gets people engaged and excited about .NET Core? Ah, uh, gotcha. So it's evangelism-ish but it's more specific where I'm going to specific places to mm -hmm. get people excited about .NET and feed their feedback right into the product, which is, which is amazing. So what do you mean by net new developer? So when I think about net new developer, I think about developers that we typically haven't reached in the past. The people who, if they heard .NET or C Sharp, they would literally roll their eyes at me. Uh -huh. So I'm talking about the places we've never been. So when you talk about .NET to a lot of newer developers, they think enterprise, they think right. closed platform, they think strictly Visual Studio on Windows. When you can talk about .NET Core now, you think about being happy wherever you want to be, uh -huh. and also the barrier of entry is so much lower than it was in the past. So if you think about, if you wanted to be a .NET developer, let's say even four years ago, you'd say, uh -huh. okay, do you have Windows? No, okay, go get Parallels on your machine. Okay, get Windows. Okay, then get Visual Studio. So in the next, next couple of hours, you know, in about six hours and Visual Studio is installed, let's learn some .NET. Okay. So it takes an entire day before you can actually get someone up and running with .NET. But now the point of entry is just so much easier. You can go and, you know, hello world at dot .NET right there in the browser. You have Visual Studio code, you know, click, click, it's installed. Uh -huh. uh, .NET new, the command line CLI is just making things so much easier for us to have those conversations, which we couldn't in the past. That makes sense. I'm also going to ask a question I think I know the answer to, mainly because I have a friend that I think worked in that program, but isn't there some kind of Microsoft boot camp here in New York? Microsoft boot camp in yeah. New York? Yeah, like some kind of training that you do in New York. Oh, okay. So For new programmers. For new programmers? Uh, I've never seen that. Okay. What Microsoft tends to do is, and there's a lot of outreach by everyone at the company. Uh -huh. Like people love to have students and people who are trying to redo their careers and they bring them in for a course for a day and uh -huh. they learn something new. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Microsoft specific things. Like okay. I've done boot camps, not even boot camps, but workshops on Python using Visual uh -huh. Studio, right? It's just making sure that you expose people to technology. Okay. The boot camps I'm talking about right now is going to Coding Dojo or Flatiron and saying, okay. let's teach you know, someone how to be a .NET developer in three months. How do we make sure not only do they learn .NET, but they're able to be successful with .NET and get jobs afterwards. So that's the next step, right? We're getting gotcha. the, but how do we make sure that those guys have jobs? That's the most important thing for me. 
right? In fact, we're going to have Avi from Flatiron School on Ruby Rogues in a couple weeks. So. He is amazing. Yeah, he's really cool. He's, um, he's, he's like one of those people who's just so passionate about truly helping people how to uh -huh. learn. He's probably one of my favorite people. Yeah, he's and then amazing. one of my Ruby Rogues co-hosts, she's not a co-host anymore, uh, Saranya Barak. One of my besties, so yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she was on the show for quite a long time. I've I've been on Code Newbie podcast, and yeah, so it's it's interesting because I know she worked for Microsoft for a while, yep. and so yeah, and so I've seen all these pieces of what you're talking about, and it's interesting to see that Microsoft is involved in building this community of programmers um, and reaching out to communities that yeah, as you said, and typically in the past, you you'd hear oh, you want me to learn how to write .NET? It's like yeah, yeah. I was one of those people. Mm -hmm. I was literally one of those people hmm. that um, first time I ever saw a .NET application, I was working at RIM. This was before it was even BlackBerry. This was before the iPhone. I was an intern. And I remember building a .NET application and saying, I don't know if I want to do that again, right? right. Because the process just seemed so, as, as, as much as it was good and you actually saw the speed and the performance and you looked at your outcome and you're like, oh, I'm so proud of this work. Mm -hmm. um, understanding the entire ecosystem was a little bit overwhelming when I compared it to different things I was learning at different internships. Right. Now, I'm able to understand it better. Maybe it's exposure, but it came in 2014 when they announced the .NET Core actually existed. That's when I got excited about .NET again. Because someone told me, he's like, you should learn .NET. You can do it on a Mac now. And I was like, never. <laughs> that was literally my reaction. I was like, I don't think so. And, and I was at Microsoft at the time. And I did it. I was like, this is pretty cool. I wrote a blog post about it, and I tweeted about it. And then Scott Hanselman saw my tweet and said, who are you? We should have coffee. And, and, and that was it. <laughs> that sounds so like Scott. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, who are you? We should have coffee. And that was the first time I met Scott Hanselman. And it's, it's been an interesting journey. And just when you see the number of jobs that are available for junior developers in this space, you want people to take that opportunity. Yes, definitely. You have a question, AJ? I don't yet. I, I, just, <laughs> I, keep, I keep rapid firing, and I'm like, I want to give him a chance to talk. <laughs> yeah, so one thing I want to know is, why should a JavaScript developer care about .NET? I think you know, that's a good, that's a really good question because a lot of people ask it about all languages. Why, mm -hmm. why should you care about this language or that language? The way I think about it is just one more thing you add on to your skill sets, right? Um, being able to do JavaScript, I think JavaScript is the most forgiving, most loving language out there ever. It's brilliant. Let's face facts. Like it, it has, it, it, you see your results immediately, right? But let's say you want to expand your opportunities beyond just JavaScript and you want a server-side language that is actually nice and easy to use now, not in the past, but now, why not learn it? Like you always know, you know, some client language and then you have a server language. It, it can be .NET, right? It can also be Ruby and it can also be Python. But the whole point is that .NET is there now and in an environment that you can use it. So it's more about exposure. So just expose yourself to it. So, um, you know, if I was to fire up a box on DigitalOcean and sudo apt-get install, what do I install to get a .NET platform going? Ah, that's a cool thing. So now, you know, it runs everywhere. Yeah, so yeah, the, 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 the motto of any dev, any platform, platform any amp, any device. Exactly, right? Yeah. And if you go to dot, dot .NET, I don't know if you've been to that website, have you? I don't think that I have. You should go there. I'll go right now. We're so excited about the domain name, <laughs> dot, dot .NET. It's like it just rolls off the tongue. Uh, so when you go to dot, dot .NET, one of the things I like about the experience is that, one, if you're on Ubuntu, sorry, I should correct it because otherwise Scott Hanselman will call me out, Ubuntu, that's the correct pronunciation, um, it will notice that you're on that platform and will show the instructions for your specific platform. And it's about five steps, you're done. Okay. Right? It's the same if you want to do it in Docker. Like if you want to set something up on Docker or on a Mac or on Windows, the whole point is that it's really easy. Mm -hmm. And even if you go to a different platform, the setup changes because, you know, it's a different operating system. But the way you actually build an application is exactly the same. Right. So you can use, so if you're a person who likes Yeoman, right, mm -hmm. and uses a lot of Yeoman generators, you can use Yeoman and ASP.NET, and you get your ASP.NET full framework application. If you, so not full framework, like, you know, ASP.NET full MVC mm -hmm. core application. And if you want to do it with the .NET commands, you can do that as well. The .NET 
type new web. So the whole thing is that it's the same experience on multiple platforms. Right. So th that's the best thing because in the past, for what I understand, you had to use mono because I like there's this whole yeah. void yes. that I don't know. <laughs> that the only the only .NET that I've written. Was it yeah, it was it was for uh, another company. We were integrating with another company, and they were C sharp devs. And for some reason, they couldn't figure out how to do an HTTP request. So I had to figure it out for them, <laughs> and then send them the sample code to be like, "This is the code. This is what it needs to run. These are the parameters." And it happened to run on their machine as well, which I was very excited about. <laughs> exactly right. So now the thing is, it's like you know we're one with them now. Mm -hmm. um, so. Your ex your um, even for people who have been using mono in the past, like I never used mono, but I can't imagine your skill sets changing that ver differently right. to adapt to what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. That's the cool thing. And now you know that what you're doing is in line with what you know the .NET team and the C# -sharp team is doing as well. Right. Yeah. To extend the platform. Well, and in, in hark harking back to what we were talking about before, the fact that you can write it anywhere on any machine. Um, you know, with any infrastructure you want to set up, it really does help bring people in. So, you know, if you're a former JavaScript developer, current JavaScript developer, something else, um, you know, you can make that connection and, and, you know, just get in and get involved and get it running. Exactly. And another thing that we want to make sure is that when you're working, starting with ASP.NET Core, um, I don't want people to assume that you have to know ASNet framework. Like that's that's a big assumption. Like, oh, but I don't know framework, and I haven't been using it for a number of years. Right. How do I get started? And I think that was also a very um, negative perception of Microsoft technology in general. Is that I have to have years of knowledge before I can actually build my first application. Mm -hmm. um, I've only built a full framework application once, and that was in 2007, right? And then I came to ASP.NET Core, and I was able to restart. Mm -hmm. without any prior knowledge. And sometimes I catch myself when I'm talking to my boss or my peers who have been doing this for so a long time, I say, please don't refer to things in the past. So we actually did right. an MBA course where before we got started, I talked to everyone who's going to be involved. And I said, please don't say, remember when? <laughs> right? Because b b the moment you say that, someone who's coming to this for the very first time is going to think, okay, let me stop. Let me go you know, Google that with Bing or Bing, right. yeah, Bingle it. And Bingle it, <laughs> I love Bingle it. it. <laughs> and, 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 and figure out what it is, right? Yep. So that's a cool thing. Another cool thing with ASP.NET Core, right? And .NET Core in general is there's no assumption of knowledge. And they've worked really, really, really hard to make sure that they do that, where you can actually come fresh-faced and say, okay, I want to learn .NET, never seen any of this before, let's go. And that's, I think that's a huge thing. That, that's really big. I mean... I know people get into, I mean, I'm pretty involved in the Ruby community and the JavaScript community. And yeah, just people coming in and then it's it's either, with JavaScript, it seems to be more future yep. facing, right? Where it's, they, they start learning the current iteration of JavaScript that's in the browser, which is ECMAScript 5. Yep. And then people start talking about ECMAScript 6 or, or ECMAScript 26, 7. 15, something. 2020, yeah. 2028. And then, um, you know, and then they're talking about TypeScript or Dart or whatever, right? And so it's like, it's like, okay, well, where am I supposed to end up? Yeah. And then, you know, in Ruby, yeah, it's like, remember the bad old days, Ruby 1.8.6? Oh, man, you know, and we're on 2.3. Those yeah. weren't bad days. So, well, things are better. Anyway, <laughs> so, but, but yeah, it's the same thing, right? So then they're like, well, do I need to know about Ruby 1.8? Mm -hmm. And the answer is no. But the fact that it's there and you kind of want to feel like part of the in crowd yeah. and be part of those conversations, you almost feel like you have to go learn all that stuff. Yeah, and I think that's unfortunate because I think you only need to know it when it comes when it becomes necessary. Right. So uh, a really good example was my demo yesterday that I did at uh, Connect. And they were talking about, oh, there are no more GUIDs. And in my head, I was like, what the <laughs> Right? So I was like, <laughs> like, I remember when the demo was first presented to me. I was uh -huh. like, oh, the CS approach file looks really nice. So I was like, oh, that doesn't look too, like, people were like, that looks amazing. I was like, oh, that looks nice. Uh -huh. And then someone stuck me and said, do you understand how bad it was before? Right. And, uh, but you see, if I had started two years ago when I looked at .NET Core, and I had to go and see, oh, it was so horrible in the past. And mm -hmm. that, that, that would have actually stopped me. But I think people will acquire knowledge when it is necessary. Yep. And as well, as long as you're, you know, 
co- not even competent, but you know what you're doing, it will naturally come. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's very important that when you're talking to people who are instructors in boot camps, that they're also aware of that. And I think that's where boot camps have kind of got it right, mm-hmm. is that they say they're training you for the job versus they're training you for like the entire industry. Like right. you want to be a mobile developer. Okay, what can we do to make sure that you are the most successful mobile developer that you can be? Like I did computer science, so sometimes I'm naturally um, inquisitive about like, the way things work mm-hmm. and I can go off tangent quite a bit. So my friend who, like for my fr- for example, a friend of mine, Ruth, she went to Flatiron and she, if I tell her, go build this application, she's done like, by the end of the day, and then right. I'm done the next day because I was like, oh, I, you know, I was thinking about how the compilers worked and how that worked. She's like, I, I just need to get this done. Yep. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that I'm always telling new people. Um, I, I really enjoy coaching new people, and I have, I have things set up so that people who listen to the podcast can get 15 minutes with me, oh, um, either nice. on Monday afternoon or Wednesday afternoon. No questions asked. They just hit schedule once, and they're on my calendar. And it's funny because about 75% are people who have gone through a boot camp or self-taught or, or some, somewhat new. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because they're like, well, I don't know all the things that everybody's talking about. And I'm like, look, do you know enough to solve these problems? And the answer is generally yes. And I'm like, well, then you're hireable now. And then the other stuff that you have to learn, you have enough core knowledge to get the rest. Like you can pick it up. Exactly. And it's and that's exactly what you were saying where it's like, look, you know, I know enough to solve a problem and then I'll pick up the stuff I don't know as I go. Exactly. And yeah, it's it's just it's funny um just how much people feel like they have to know versus what will actually get them through the job. Exactly. And I think we're still thinking of like programming as an individual thing versus a community thing. Right. And that's why things like GitHub have been so influential mm-hmm. in making people forcing people to literally work together on a piece of right. code. And the joy of asking questions. Mm-hmm. So I like I always tell people there's a joy in asking a question mm-hmm. versus of like if you need if you have a question, just ask me. It's like there's literally a joy when you ask yep. a question because it takes you from like I'm gonna Google this until I die uh-huh. versus like I'm gonna go ask someone who has experience and I'm gonna solve this in ten minutes. So yeah. I had this issue I can't even remember anymore. And I just sent a message to an IM to David Fowler. I was uh-huh. like, David do you know how to do this? Like, yes, A, B, C, done. Yep. Something that I was actually spending the entire evening just searching. And then I just asked this person and they just gave me the information. So there's this joy in asking. And I think with Microsoft being open source as well with the .NET Core, I think we are also embracing the joy of asking questions from the community and getting questions in the community. Like, I think yep. you've seen how um, the engineers are like, does it make sense for me to set up the .NET standard library like this? And people are like, yes or no. It's like when people do it with yep. Instagram, like, do you like the green shirt or the blue shirt? Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really interesting. Yeah. Yep. Well, and the other thing is, is that, yeah, if you don't have somebody that you can just reach out and touch and say, hey, I don't know this. I mean, there's Stack Overflow. There's yep. GitHub issues. There's, I mean, Code there newbie. Are, yeah. <laughs> Slack channels. Yeah. It's just, there are all these places where, People are happy to help. Yeah. And you don't have to have all the answers. No, you don't. You Like, we're in a time now where you don't have to ask, have all the answers. Like, I remember when I first learned how to code, and this was maybe 2002, 2003. And, and if you had it to get something, and I was in Uganda, mm-hmm. I literally had to get a book. You had to open it up and hope that the answer was somewhere there. There was no... Uh, searching for it on the internet because mm-hmm. people are still going to internet cafes to find out answers. Right. So you literally had to look at a book and hopefully oh, wow. the answer was in there. But right now, everything is at the touch of your hand. Like mm-hmm. your first pull request is another really good one. I don't know if you guys have heard about it. I th- is that the article written by Kensi Dots? Yes, right? Where he said, like, you know, be comfortable with your first pull request. And people ask, like, oh, I don't understand how Git clone ask that works. And people are like, oh, and people are so excited to help people. Like, how do I merge your branch? Those are really positive ways. I, I actually um, took from, I don't know if it was that article or the companion article, but he mentions, like, some Git tags that he suggests that you use for people to do their their first pull requests for like easy tasks like correcting spelling mistakes and documentation or whatever. And so I actually opened up a couple of of those types of issues on some of my repos and just tagged them. I think it was first timers, timers only. only. Yeah. And then up for grabs is the other one. Yeah. 
And uh, so I just went and put those on some of my my issues, and and then uh, they started showing up in these other feeds that people are looking at. And I actually had some people come in and fix like things that would have taken me two seconds, but it's like. Eh, it's not that important exactly. and I don't yeah. want to do it right now. Yes. So it was worth putting the tag on it, but not worth actually doing it for me. But yeah. somebody else did it and they felt great. And then I was like, sweet, I got a contributor. And yeah. that's huge. And imagine how empowering that is for that person. Who oh, absolutely. It. Especially since I've seen on a lot of these repos on GitHub or whatever, they, the fact that you created the repo, even if it does something really simple, they kind of see you as this expert. Yep. And so they get validated by an expert, which is really awesome. Which is it was huge, because yeah. I think I had the same thing with Coding Dojo, where um, I don't know if you guys remember Nerd Dinner. Nerd Dinner was like one of the first MVC applica- ASP.NET MVC applications. Okay. It was written by uh, Phil Hack, Scott Hanselman, Scott Guthrie, and John Galloway. Okay. And it was in ASP.NET... I think one something. <laughs> it was uh-huh. a really old version. And I worked on transitioning it to ASP.NET Core. And Coding Dojo is one of the first schools that is teaching .NET Core, right? Um, one of the first net new people that we've got teaching .NET Core. And one of the students looked at my repo and said, oh, you should actually upgrade this to 1.1. And I was like, okay, go do it. And this is a person who had only had two weeks of learning .NET Core. She went and she upgraded it to 1.1. Oh, wow. Isn't that huge? That's I was, awesome. I, thought, I, was like, I, was, I was like, this is amazing. Like, I could have done this in two seconds, you know, but uh-huh. she's done. She pointed it out to me. She had an issue. She's like, um, excuse me, you should actually upgrade this to 1.1. One, one. I was like, oh, yeah, why don't you do it? And she yeah. did it. And, and she was like, I just upgraded an entire application to ASP.NET 1.1. One, one. I was like, that's big. That's awesome. Let's pause for a moment to talk about our sponsor, Taurus. Taurus is a new tool for managing and securing the secret information that allows your app to run. You know the stuff. Passwords, API keys, database credentials, all the stuff that gives access to the private stuff that you don't want anybody to touch except for your application in specific ways. Taurus provides a convenient way to store all this information in the cloud, and they can't access it because it's encrypted with material derived from your password, which is never transmitted to their server. So it's secured from them, from everybody else, but accessible to you. This means only the servers, development machines, and applications you've allowed can access the information. So make secrets management headaches a thing of the past and check out Taurus today. You can find them at devchat.tv slash Taurus. That's devchat.tv slash T-O-R-U-S. So one question that I'm wondering about, we've talked a lot about people who have either come into the community or being open to other communities, but how do we get new programmers? How do we get people who are doing other things, they have other jobs or they don't have jobs to say, oh, well, programming, I could learn that. Yeah. And get them into our ecosystem so that we can start training them and getting them to contribute to the world of code. Yeah, I think some like some of the boot camps are doing that really really well like i really like what flat iron school is doing like i have friends who have gone through that program and have gone from 20 grand to like 70 grand a year mm-hmm. and the way we do it is one boot camps are really expensive they're mm-hmm. really expensive yeah they are they're so expensive and there's no real funding for it so being able as people who are active in the communities as, de- as developers who have been in the industry for a number of years mm-hmm. we should probably look into how do we help the boot camp standardize so we can have more people going into them so they can apply for things like loans right, right? Mm. so that's like that's the one thing mm-hmm. that i would really like to see because we have the boot camps doing it but they they're all instructors and they're all really great instructors right. but they need the help of people in the community the number of times um, the boot camps love the fact that they have someone from the product team who's like, oh, I build .NET Core, I build Visual Studio, I work on C Sharp, and this is what you need to know to become a successful C Sharp .NET developer. Right. They appreciate that because that's real industry insight. Mm-hmm. We need to go beyond industry indu- insight and also provide like panels and backups and maybe like form boards that actually help standardize the way people learn different programming languages so we can have more people coming in because we can kind of treat it almost like vocational mm-hmm. training. We have more people coming in who are able to get the scholarships they need to go through. Right. Um, like I was working, Coding Dojo is one I've been working with a lot. Um, and they've been working, how do we get Syrian refugees who are coming into Seattle trained 
mm-hmm. and getting jobs. So they've been right. working with different organizations and NGOs to help them get funding. But how do we make sure that we create certifications and standardizations around mm-hmm. helping these people get jobs? Right. Because unless you go to a very popular boot camp, how do I show that, oh, I'm qualified in Ruby or I'm qualified mm-hmm. in Python? And the way we do that is standardization. Right. So interesting that you bring this up because I somebody had just posted on Twitter uh, last night about why are people complaining about technology taking away jobs? And so I responded to that because there's always going to be a bottom 20%. Yeah. Always. So you can raise the bottom 20%. It's still the bottom 20%. But when technology takes away jobs, it widens the gap between the members of the bottom 20% because you have unskilled labor that people were doing that they can't do anymore. And so the more we automate, the more we take away people's jobs. And that's you know bad socially. And what you're describing sounds like a way to fix that problem where we know that there's going to be more jobs in technology, but that's skilled labor and it requires learning. So if we can lower the barrier to entry on that learning to allow people to transition from unskilled labor to skilled labor that is at a, at a lower barrier, then we can better our social circumstances in our economy. Exactly. Because everyone's saying, go in... Go into code, go into code, go into tech, go into tech, but they're not really giving people guidance on how, how do you actually do that? Yeah. Um, cause well, and with the cost of the boot camps, it's too, it's like, okay, well, I want to go into tech, but I don't have 12 grand or 16 grand or whatever it costs to go. Yeah. So, yeah, what? How, how do I do that? How do you do that? And, and that's a big question. Like, there are some boot camps where it's free, like, they're nonprofit boot camps, mm-hmm. like the Turing School in Colorado. Yes. They're really cool. Um, also, and I know Jeff Casimir over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've talked to him once on the phone. He's really nice. And then there's also the Grace Hopper Academy that teaches JavaScript. You guys should probably get their dean on the sco- on the. Oh, that would be show. great. You should really get her on the show. I forget her name right now, but. We also had uh, Quincy Lawson. Quincy Law, yeah, it's from, from 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 free free, free, free code, code camp. camp, yeah, yeah. So um, and that's an online program. In fact, I found out one of my neighbors is <laughs> doing it in her yeah. spare time. She's got five kids, and yep. her husband works for Vivint, which is the security company. Okay, okay. And yeah, it was just it was just funny. It was like it was like, oh really? She's like, yeah, I love coding, you know. And I had never, I would have never thought, you know, that that would be a thing that she would enjoy, but. But yeah. she's enjoying it because yeah, she has exposure, right? Yeah. And like um, things like the great. But she has physical limitations too, so she can't go do some of the exactly. other things, right? So, but we should be able to provide that yeah. kind of entry where you can go learn how to do something. Because I feel like coding eventually become like literacy, like people will know how to read right. and write code. Not everyone will go in to build like the .NET, the next .NET, or the next JavaScript. Right. Or the, but we do need to have people to be able to to understand it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because if we're telling people to go into tech and tech is a feature, we need to provide an entry for them so it's available to everyone. The same right. way reading and writing is available to uh-huh. most people. So we need to do the same thing. And things like, you know, being able to fund, that's important. Right. To be able to actually fund. Not like, oh, here's a day boot camp. No, this is three months where we can actually change uh-huh. your life. Right. We can actually do something that's going to be impactful. Right. And and, and like when I was going to college, because I went to college full time and I worked part time. But these code camps, a lot of the boot camps are set up in such a way to where you go to school all day and then you go home and work the exercises yeah. all evening. So you really don't even have time to You don't. It's hold intense. Down a job. It's like yeah. forty weeks, I be, forty hours a week or something like that. It's something yeah. like that. It's, it's it's more than that. I mean the the code camps yeah. are full time plus. Yeah, it's full yeah. time. It's like I think it's forty hours of like in person study right. and you're not including the um yeah, the, the extra going work, home and the assignments, your code. Yeah. the yeah, you, you submitting s- them. You spend between six and ten hours every day at the code camp. Yeah. And then you go get something to eat, you work on more project stuff, yeah. you come back in the morning and grab Dunkin' Donuts on your way. Yep. And then you're at it again. Yeah, that's and, your day. And and people, especially during the project weeks, people will be at the code school for twelve, sixteen, twenty hours. Right, working on the capstone project. Yeah, yeah, working on their capstone project. And you're seeing it, every, and every single code school is different. Yes. And, like, I've, I've only worked with three so far that I, like, uh-huh. in general, but I'm hoping to work with about 14 by the end of the year. So right. hopefully by the end of the year, .NET, end of the next financial year, so in 2017. Um, .NET will hopefully be in 6 to 14 
different oh, wow. boot camps across the country. But success for me is more than just like, oh, did we get it in there? But did we get it in there and are the students successful? Are right. they actually able to get junior developer.net jobs across the country? Because if you actually look at the numbers, like Robert Half Hall, do you know them, the tech recruiting yes. company? So they wrote a paper, um, I was reading a paper that they did earlier this year. And you look at the top five jobs across the country, with the exception of like San Francisco, .NET and C Sharp appear in the top five jobs across the country in the other oh, wow. regions. So you just say, I like, and the, the entire paper was like, they are .NET jobs and you know they exist. And on average, they can make up to 8% more for entry level jobs. And I was like, huh, do these people know about this? Right. Because when people think about .NET, they think about enterprise, like major enterprise. Like they think about Microsoft and Google right. and Ernst and & Young and all these huge places. When I think about .NET before, I think of like the kind of what the terrible vision, dreaded vision that I'd have in my head is like a cubicle where there are no doors and no windows and only fluorescent lights, <laughs> flickering dim ones, <laughs> and and like a terminal CRT. <laughs> Well, AJ, Windows or Microsoft always had Windows in those rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but they weren't working. <laughs> but but yeah, and and I have some background as a Windows Systems mm -hmm. Administrator when I was in college, and so yeah, I. But it was it was an enterprise. Yep. And and that was always the the vision I had of it was you either had the desktop version on your computer, or yeah you were writing something for the enterprise because exactly. that was my experience. And the thing is that when people see that and they think you have to be, it's always the big companies, mm -hmm. um, they can get intimidated. They'll be like, you know, I went to a boot camp. How am I going to compete with someone who went to college, right? Yeah, but ultimately, and so I'm writing a book on how okay. to find a job as a new programmer. Oh, cool. And yeah, what I tell people is, look, the company, if they're hiring people with degrees on purpose, it's because their perception is is that those people can solve their problems better than somebody else. Yeah. But the, the reality is is that if you show up having graduated from a boot camp and you can demonstrate that you can solve problems better than the college grads, they will hire you instead. A hundred percent. And there are actually programs in place at like a lot of these big companies. I know Walmart mm -hmm. has one. I know Microsoft has them. Where there's, there's a Microsoft Leap program that mm -hmm. actually is specific to help and recruit from boot camps where they actually work and say, how do we get these people into Microsoft? And, and that's big because they're like, we're investing. How do we get you in? Yep. And there, there are a number of large companies that have very rather famously had a college degree as part of their uh, requirements. Like you had to have a computer science degree in order to get hired there. Yeah. And many, many of them are dropping that requirement now because they can get those people from other places. You can. And they do just as good a job. No, like some of the most amazing developers I've met don't have college, like didn't do computer science in school. Like my friend Stacy Mulcahy, um, she's in, she moved over to Canada. She was a journalist. Mm -hmm. And now she's like, I think she's one of the respected people in HTML, JavaScript, and now she runs a Microsoft garage in Vancouver. And she's like, I was a journalist. Like I was literally, I, I had every intention of working for the New York Times and here I am working for Microsoft building like IOT stuff and like you have she has all these pictures on Twitter. You should check her out. She's the bitch who codes on Twitter. I don't know if you guys know of her. I don't know of her, but I would love an introduction. She's amazing. She's she's definitely a person that you should have on the show because she has very interesting perception, like no, really interesting view on how people get into code. And like they're different it's a different path for everyone. And that's the whole thing. Like I went to school and school was my path. Like going mm -hmm. and did I did computer science, biomedical engineering, and I was like, why did I do biomedical engineering? I'm not using it now. But it was so much fun when yep. I did it. Um, there are different paths for everyone. And my like I've seen so many people come from different paths at Microsoft and that's nice to see. That's yep. really nice to see. Another case in point, when I was a systems administrator at Brigham Young University, that's where oh, I went to okay. school. Yeah. Um, we worked with the teams of developers because obviously they had to deploy their stuff to our servers. And uh, there were two teams that were upstairs in the building we were in from us that we worked with rather frequently. And I'm not kidding, three quarters of both of those teams that were building web-based applications for the university had law degrees. And so it's just, you know, from wherever, right? But they realized they didn't like being a lawyer. They liked writing code. Yeah, <laughs> and that's like where they wound up. Exactly. Like, um, my sister was telling me that there's a mom's coding group in Long Island City, Queens. Oh, cool. Very cool. Yeah, so there are all these moms who, like, they were all doing jobs. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And they weren't too happy with their jobs. It was all the way from people who are in HR to people who are lawyers and doctors. And, you know, as they're beginning to transition what they're doing, they started a mom's coders group. And they meet in the coffee shops and they actually just sit and code. It's like five women and all they do is like, oh, okay, where'd you learn that? We went to code school. You guys should do this. And I was like, Th- that's big, right? Just I'm going to recommend that to my neighbor. <laughs> yeah, like let her start a, like, yeah. a coding group for parents where they get home, you know, yep. kids are at school. Let's code, right? Yep. That could be cool. That's very cool. Now I need to find them too because I think that would be another just interesting conversation to have. Yeah. yeah. It's really the mom coders group of LIC. I told them they should become official. They should just like, they just meet. And I was like, you guys are the mom's coders group of LIC. Well, it's funny because, um, so in the Ruby community, Mm -hmm. one of the uh, more prolific and popular groups of of Rubyists is Seattle RB. Okay, what's that? It's it's just, uh, it's kind of the meetup users group in Seattle. Okay. But there's a core group of like four or five developers there. And yeah. They would all get together in a coffee shop and work in the same space all day long. And yeah, I mean, there's no reason why a mom's group in Long Island or anywhere else yeah. couldn't turn into something like that where it's it's like, hey, we get together and contribute open source. Or hey, we get together and we've all worked on this project that we're now going to launch as a SaaS or use to commu- yeah. contribute to the community or whatever. And yeah, it's it, all the possibilities of all this stuff is just getting me really excited. It's like, because like, so a friend of mine was telling me, she actually works at Microsoft as well, where there are a group of girls, um, girls and boys in her neighborhood in Long Island in Westchester, mm-hmm. and they all did a coding camp, and they got so excited. So they started a tutor group uh-huh. where they teach younger kids how to code, and they have a GitHub repo where they put in their classes and the instructions. And oh, all wow. That. And the whole point is that, uh, they do it as seniors, and the mm-hmm. whole point is that you get the next group of people ready to take over that, and the next group. So they want every single senior class is responsible. Oh wow! In growing this repository, and I think that's huge. That's cool. Yeah. Are you familiar much with JavaScript? Not as much as I should be. Tell me more. Well, <laughs> not, I, I was actually just going to ask. Um, well, because I've noticed. The, the the thing that that I'm I'm famous for on the show is is being a hater of ECMAScript because it's replacing JavaScript and I actually quite like JavaScript, but um, I've noticed that JavaScript really seems to be transitioning to look a lot more like what I think of C sharp, okay. like you know like TypeScript and mm-hmm, TypeScript, uh, okay. you know all of that all of that um, that ECMAScript stuff that people are doing await and async I, and okay. all of that all of those keywords are things that I've seen. I, I think probably in, in C Sharp mm-hmm. and, yeah, and other languages. Yeah. Um, so when I look at C Sharp code, that actually, f- I have less of a panic attack than when I look at ECMAScript code because okay. C Sharp code makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> and JavaScript makes sense mm-hmm. to me, but ECMAScript does not make sense to me. I haven't looked at it yet. But, um, well, it, I, w- I was just kind of wondering like uh, features of C Sharp that are JavaScript y, like, um, you know, Node.js, the reason it became popular is because there's the event loop. Yeah. And that has pros and cons in running in a single process. Um, like, for example, if you want to share memory, you have to have two processes and you have to have like a socket or yeah. something to share between them. But in C Sharp, you get the benefits of having multiple processes so and being able to do some sort of mechanism to, to join them together to make it not complicated like it would have been in C or yeah. in the olden days. And so I... Kind of wanted to ask about some of some of those those details of of what about C sharp is JavaScripty? Do you know that would be you know the perfect? I'm not the right person to ask about that the JavaScriptiness, but a really good person to talk to if you, and you should have on the show is um, Casey Ullenhuth. Oh, uh-huh. she's over there. Yeah, you should really talk to Casey because Casey looks at things like that, like um, how do you make C-sharp friendly and happy and all those kind of <laughs> things. And, and, uh, and it, it's, it's a great, it's, a great um, it's actually a really good talking point because when I do talk to bootcamp instructors right now, so a good example is that there's a bootcamp instructor I'm working with at Coding Dojo, Dylan. And when Dylan first looked at .NET and C-sharp, he was like, no, nah, no, nah, not doing it. 
And then he keeps on telling me is that since he's been doing JavaScript for such a long time, and now that he's looking at C Sharp, he, 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 he's like, oh, I can learn more languages. So mm -hmm. it, it's like the joy of like what JavaScript did in making things more accessible to people has forced other languages to be equally as um, easier to write. So that's actually really good to see as well. But like when it comes to JavaScriptiness, no. I don't really, I can't really answer <laughs> no, that because unfortunately I haven't written a JavaScript application in a very long time. I think the last time was in school and I don't want to mention the year because I don't want people to guess my age. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> just don't get in front of any of those cognitive services bots then either. Oh, do you know what I usually come out as? A 78-year-old man. You come out as a 78-year-old man. man. Oh, okay. wow. That's weird. It's weird and it's sad. <laughs> well, if are you, you gonna say yes? You kind of look like. If one. you ask me, I was gonna say no. You don't really look like a seventy-eight-year-old man to me. So I'm, thank you. I'm just <laughs> trying to figure out how in the world that could come up. Like I'm trying to see your face as a computer sees your face for yep. a second, right? Because you you don't have like any wrinkles, <laughs> right? No, I mean like you you have little s smile lines, but you don't have wrinkles, right? You, you don't have crow's feet, <laughs> okay? And and so I'm like, okay, I'm trying to imagine, like, I'm what if I did a black and white right filter now, or whatever? Let's go to pics. <laughs> <laughs> let's take a break from this episode and really quickly talk about finding a job. You know, searching for a job can feel stressful, scary, and time-consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want, and the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through an interview process just to find out that the very end that the salary offer or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Well, there's a solution. Hired.com is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities. They make the job search faster, focused, and stress-free instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best. Hired puts you in control of how and when you connect with compelling opportunities. And after completing one simple application, top employers apply to you. And the best part is, is that you get money. That's right. They pay you if you get a job through them. Listeners to this show can earn double their normal hiring bonus by signing up with the show's link. That's right. You get $2,000 instead of $1,000. So go sign up at Hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. So uh, one thing that we do at the end of our shows yeah. is uh, we have what we call picks. And it's just... Something, it's a shout out basically okay. to something, anything. It could be TV shows, it could be um, technical tools, it could, be, I mean, anything. You read a book you liked, you know. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and do our picks first. Okay. And that way you can kind of get an idea of what we do, and then you can go ahead and shout out about whatever you want. Okay. Um, AJ, do you have a pick you want to share? Uh, yeah. So I'm going to pick things that I've already picked, but that I still think are great. Uh, one is the album Super Cartography Bros, which is a uh, an overclocked remix album, a video game, kind of a just a, a fun Mario Brothers style uh, remix set. And then uh, also, again, my company Dapply, we are taking back the internet with a home cloud system. So it's more than just storage; it's uh, apps and uh, developer interfacing and, and all sorts of goodies. And if you'd like to check that out, we uh, have our Kickstarter up on Indiegogo. And we also have the opportunity for people to invest in the company because we're doing kind of a for the people, by the people model. And we're on WeFunder as well. So if you go to daply.com, D-A-P-L-I-E.com, uh, you can check us out and click either of the pre-order or invest buttons there. And uh, if you believe in the cause, love to have you join us. All right, um, I've got a couple of picks here. Um, so I just hired a business coach to help me expand what I'm doing with the podcast, reach more audiences, um, and just overall improve the developer experience. Uh, her name is Jamie Masters, and she actually has her own podcast. It's called The Eventual Millionaire. Mm -hmm. And uh, she only interviews millionaires on her show, and they talk about what they've done, and then they talk about how they did it. And it's, it's a terrific show. So if you're looking for some content, if you're an entrepreneur and you're just thinking, man, it'd be great to find out how people build companies that are super successful, then um, go check it out, eventualmillionaire.com. 
And then I'm also going to quickly shout out about the conferences. Um, so as some of you listeners may know, uh, we put on remote conferences uh, throughout the year. So uh, JavaScript Remote Conf, which is germane to this conversation, um, will be in March. If you want to speak, the call for proposals is up through the end of December. And so if you, and then if you want to uh, get a ticket, I have early bird tickets up through my birthday this year, which is December 14th. Th that's early, early birds. And then the early bird tickets end sometime in January. So, you know, if you want to get discounted tickets, go check those out. Um, and all of the information is available at devchat.tv slash conferences. And then I also mentioned that I do those 15 minute calls. If you go to devchat.tv slash 15 minutes, that's the number one, five minutes. Um, you can get on my calendar. I've, I don't care if you've listened to one episode or several hundred episodes. I, I love talking to people and just getting a feel for where you're at, what you're doing, uh, answer any questions. I've had people call up and we chat for five minutes where I'm asking them a few questions about the shows that they've liked. And then the, the other 10, 15, you know, we go over sometimes minutes are them asking me questions about their career and how they can get ahead, how I can help them, things like that. And I, I just, I love having those conversations. They're terrific. So um, again, that's devchat.tv slash 15 minutes, please. Um, if you're thinking, well, you know, he's been programming for what must be forever because he has these podcasts and, um, I'm a new person. Don't worry about that stuff. Honestly, I love talking to everybody. So, uh, just jump in and do it. Maria, what do you, what do you have for picks? Oh, I have a, a actually I have three. Uh, one of the things I wanted to call out is the Codeland conference that's happening in April. Oh, yes. Right? Saran's putting that yeah, on, Saran's and I was super excited about too. it. Me yeah. too. I'm, I'm teaching a workshop, and I'm really excited uh -huh. about it. It's going to be here in New York. It's going to be here, and in this office. It's going to be right here. I booked out the whole of the six floor. It's going to be in this office? It's going to be in this office. We're gonna We're going to make it look dope. I'm just going to camp out here until the conference. J just do that. I'll hide you in the cupboard. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we got this. <laughs> The, and so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, the next thing I'd like to call out is a graphic novel I just finished reading called The March by Senator John Lewis. So, and actually Congressman John Lewis. And I don't know if you guys know who Congress John... I don't. Okay, so Congressman John Lewis was... Is he from here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, he was one of the people who marched on Washington and worked with Martin Luther King. And reading oh, that book cool. has given me so much exposure to America because I'm not an American. So I've got insight to <coughs> something I had never known before. And the fact that it's a graphic novel is just so amazingly beautiful because I love to draw. I'm an artist myself. So I draw a lot of graphic right. novels myself. And the last thing I'd like to call out is... Um, the Microsoft Virtual Academies that I did on getting started with ASP.NET Core. And I'm really excited about that because we really, really worked hard to make sure that we lowered the point of entry and we made it easy to understand for anyone who is coming in um, to .NET for the first time or someone who has .NET experience. And we've got amazing feedback on that. So you can follow me on Twitter at Lady Nagaga. It kind of is like Lady Gaga. Mm -hmm. But like it's my last name. It's Lady and then my last name, Nagaga, which is N-A-G-G-A-G-A. -G -G -A. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. This has been really fun. And um, yeah, I, I mean, there's so much to talk about in programming. And I think sometimes we get so focused on the technical stuff that we forget to talk about the community. And um, even though we have JavaScript communities and .NET communities, we all are part of the programming yep. community, and we're all working for a lot of the same things. And so it's just it's really great to just hear your perspective here and where you've come from and what you're trying to do here at Microsoft. So thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. All right. Well, I think that's it. <laughs> I, I do want to splice in one more question if I can. Go ahead. Um, so, it, so part of engaging with newer developers, like I, I really am enthralled by the Raspberry Pi and systems that are like it because they give people a platform that they can let sit. You know, like your, your laptop you're taking around, you're moving around the place, but something like a Raspberry Pi um, is, you know, you, you can run code on there and let it sit. So is, uh, is .NET Core, does it run on... Uh, Linux and Windows Raspberry Pi or or devices like that? Or? It does. Okay. It does. So you actually can run a .NET Core application on a Raspberry Pi. So and I could have my little bedroom web, web server. Yeah, you could. You could actually do that. And that actually might be a really good blog post and project we could do. And actually have it up on GitHub and say, here you go. 
Okay. That's a really cool one. Like one of the things I would love to see in the IoT area is a device that is a Raspberry Pi is cheap. Um, at what? It's nineteen bucks. Thirty-five. Thirty-five. It would be nice to see one that was even cheaper because this is the reason why I want it to be more accessible to more people. There's a Pi Zero that's five dollars. Yes, that's but what it I doesn't have networking support. Oh, okay. Or it doesn't. Ha you have to plug it into a USB. It doesn't it's not built in? I don't think. Yeah, but there are a lot of other systems out there, the Edison, BeagleBones, stuff like well, that. The, uh, a lot of those are focused around JavaScript, but I wonder if you could make .NET Core work on them. There's, I, I saw something on either Kickstarter or Indiegogo recently that was, it was basically just an Ethernet port with the processor on the board as well, and that was the size of the board. Mm, interesting. Um, it was like, I, again, it was like five dollars or so. Yeah. Now, they, if you have more devices, because I'm one thing I'm huge about is accessibility, right? Uh -huh. um, if we're going to tell people like get involved in IoT, and it's such an exciting thing to have. Yeah. We need to also make IoT devices at accessible price points, um, and that's the cool thing about code is that you, code is pretty much free now. So mm -hmm. by that advantage, it's it's accessible. The only thing limitation is what kind of computer you can run it on. But now with IoT, it's so much fun, and everyone should have an opportunity to work with it. So the more we can create IoT devices that are accessible at pretty much any price point, is the more we can bring these all over the world. Yeah, and I, when speaking of IoT, I, I think the thing that's really important that will make it take off in the consumer space is when it, it's finally able to be private. You know, as developers are able to work on it in their homes, because right now the things that are IoT are like the Nest and, and those yeah. other systems are all, they're not something that you can personally really dive into at yeah. home and and the connection is all somewhere else. And so I really like the idea of, of bringing it to developers in their own homes and letting them create the solutions that hit shelves rather than... Oh, I get what you mean. You know, because it, it, for it to be successful, because people, people are fine with having Google on their phone and knowing where they are all the time. <laughs> and they maybe don't realize just how invasive that can be, but when it comes to products in the home, the, the products that large companies have tried to put in the home haven't been very successful, and I think privacy is a big part of that. That's probably true. So I, I do like always knowing about the, yeah, the, the, can I do it privately, can I do it at my home, can I do it small? Yeah, I got what you mean. Yeah, good point.